The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Daily Racing Forum Saturday Breeders' Cup 2017 handicapping session presented by the Breeders' Cup. Some guaranteed wagers folks are going to want to check out between this late pick four and the, and the ultra pick six on uh, Saturday's races. It's going to be a fantastic day of racing, and I'm so excited to get to hear the thoughts of two players. I always want to hear what they have to say about races I'm betting whenever I have the opportunity, the kind of people who can sway my opinion and especially cause me to include extra horses in races where I was planning to spread we have with us from the DRF Players podcast. Um, you know him. You love him. He's the people's champ. He's Jonathan Kinchin. JK, what's going on? So I convinced you to include, and you've just spent the last 20 minutes getting me to take horses out of my pick six. <laughs> <laughs> That's the relationship. Such is the relationship that we have. And we also have joining us on the phone. He is the author of the new book, Betting with an Edge. It's going to be on sale any minute on DRF.com. If you signed up and are joining us live for this webinar, you'll be getting an email with a special offer regarding the book. He is pro horse player Mike Maloney. Mike, how are things? Everything's good, Pete. Great to be with you guys. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we are pressed for time, so I say we dive right in for the first race in this Breeders' Cup Ultra Pick 6. It is the seventh race on Saturday, the Breeders' Cup fill Billy and Mayor Turf. Mike, as our guest uh, for this sort of semi-extra edition of the, the DRF Players podcast slash handicapping session, let's have you go first. All right. Uh, I have an opinion in this race, Pete, and it, it, it may be a little chalky, the main uh, uh, focus of the, of the bet, but uh, I, I'm all over Lady Eli in here, and, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, such a great sentimental story. i the, the racing fan in me, you know, loves the story, uh, but the handicapper in me loves the horse. So uh, it, it, you, you need the horse to pull for. I just, I just don't see her out of the exact in this race. And even though on the on the win odds, she's probably not going to be an overlay. Uh, it, it's still valuable in the Breeders' Cup scenario when you can find a horse that you can rely on to to center all your bets around and rely on a horse to be first or second. So that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, the main horses that I'm going to use her with, I'm really probably my second choice would be Wuhida. I like the way she's coming in the race. think she's live, and you may get a little value there. I'm also going to include the two Singa, the eight Grand Jete, the 12 Avenge, just kind of on a uh, lone speed scenario. Uh, so mix those numbers around, but uh, Lady Eli is the focus for sure. Makes a lot of sense, Mike. Very hard to see her being out of the three, that's for sure. J.K., how do you see this one? Yeah, I agree with Mike about Lady Eli. So I, I for, the, for the sake of time and repetition, well, I, there's no reason to repeat all the things he said. She's special, and I think she'll run well. The mile and eighth hits hit her right in between the eyes. She's three for three at the distance. So uh, the Philly and Mare turf being run at a mile and eighth this year, which typically isn't, uh, is, is great for her. I, I'm, I'm going to use the other Chad pretty heavily as well, the eight Grand Jeté. Um, I thought Grand Jeté, if you look back at her PP, she's had two tough trips in a row. Uh, you know, the, the Beverly D obviously wasn't ideal. And even though the allowance race that she won in uh, was a little bit too cute to me, I, you know, I, I thought that Joel uh, was a little bit, uh, a little bit too cute. And, and he does that from time to time where he waited too long. And, and then, so then she comes back in the Beverly D and, and it was probably best that day. And then we've talked about it before. It's a jockey's dilemma. I don't want to knock Javier Castellano for putting her on the lead last time. Uh, you can't you can't knock him for doing both of those things, being aggressive and and or taking back. So I think she's going to get a better trip here. I know the barn has always liked her very much. And you can tell by the way that she's bet. She was bet more than Decida was in her last race after Decida came off of the Beverly uh, Beverly D win. So Grand Jeté is going to be one of my focus points there. I'm going to use the uh, the 14 Rhododendron a little bit. And uh Honestly, yesterday on the airplane, I got more in love with Decida than I was prior. I know there's not a lot of pace in this race, but we talk about it all the time where we allow closers into the race. And I think Decida is one of those closers that's going to be allowed into the race and can quicken with these. Uh, should love the surface. Uh, you know, she's been she's always looking for firm surface. This is going to be her first time in California, I believe. And I think that she's going to really excel at that. A uh, little bit pace compromised, but I think she's one that I would include. 
the you got the chat, you got the main chat, the other chat, and the other other chat with the with the CETA. Wagering strategy wise though, JK, just to clarify a little bit, you'd be keying things in the verticals around Lady Eli. Yeah, I'm thinking a horse wise for like picks for the picks or whatever. Uh, I think Lady Eli and Grand Jete would be my A horses. Uh, Rhododendron would be an A, but her 14 draw will probably push her to a B to save a little bit of money there. And then I'll probably use the Cita as a B as well. And out of pure respect for Mike, I'll toss in Wajita so that I don't have to uh, – we can celebrate together if things go right. I like it. I like it. Let's move on to the Breeders' Cup Sprint, the second leg of this Ultra Pick 6. JK, let's keep it with you. This is one of the races I'm most excited about betting. Um, I, I, I respect Dre Fong. Uh, Dre Fong is, is a nice horse. And uh, uh, however, I think that he's going to be extremely overbet based on his Breeders' Cup championship last year. Uh, his his uh, seven furlong win in the four go when he was on a loose lead where everyone in the world knew he was going to win. Um, and, and so I, for, for, for that reason, I'm going to try to lean elsewhere. Uh, I'm not going to let him beat me, but I love American pastime with the race over the surface. Uh, two back at Del Mar ran really big on this surface and then ran well. Um, and the gallant Bob, after kind of missing the break a little bit, is training well from all accounts. Um, Ransom the Moon, who I thought uh, we, we always talk about uh, California six furlong speed. Well, how about California six furlong closer? I think he could pick up the pieces if it gets a little bit uh, hairy. I know his last race wasn't great, but watch the gallop out on that tape. It kind of makes you feel a little bit better. And then Imperial Hint. I know he hasn't been racing against much, quote unquote, but, but uh, Andy Byer was lucky enough to create speed figures for us. And the speed figures usually don't lie. This horse is fast and I think he'll run well today or tomorrow. Excuse me. All right, Mike, what do you think about this one? It's like Jonathan's reading my mind on Dre Fong. Uh, well, I have written here over bet in my, in my PP. So we're on the same page there. You have to protect yourself defensively. I'm not saying to get crazy and pitching, but, uh, you know, Bob Baffert, Mike Smith, uh, you know, won the race last year. It's, uh, you know, you're going to get no value with that horse, and, and he's going to have to run early. He has no choice from the inside draw but to go. I think Tackleful is going to be laying on him. I think there's going to be other horses coming on the turn, so it's going to be a, uh, you know, it's going to be a legit pace. Uh, I'll use Drayfong defensively. My main focus will be Roy H. Uh, I think there'll be enough pace to get him in the mix. I think he'll run up on the turn. DeSormo will have him outside in a good striking spot when they turn for home and I you know I, he's not clearly the best horse to me he's just the horse I trust the most to fire and a lot of times that's what I'm looking for when I'm trying to put these verticals together I want I want not only a fast horse but I want a dependable horse and that's what I see and I think basically Roy H is the horse you can depend on to be in the try then I'm going to uh, include Drayfong, Ransom the Moon, and Imperial Hint around him, and and then maybe mix in some other contenders on, on the bottom of the try. But those will be the horses that I'm using in first and second positions. Something to pay attention to, uh, JK and Mike, so good at this idea of designing a race. And I love when Mike was talking, you know, not just looking at the at the form and trying to think about what's going to happen at the wire, but trying to run that mental picture in your head of who's going to be where at the different stages of the race. The time form pace projector that uh, producer Jake was demonstrating a moment ago, a great way to aid in doing that. And then you make further tweaks the same way that uh, Mike and JK were just doing. All right, let's go on to the ninth race. It's the Breeders' Cup Mile. Uh, Mike, what's the key to this race for you? Well, speaking of designing a race, you led right in here perfectly because this race is a classic meltdown race, in my opinion. Uh, you, you have just all the speed you could possibly sign on to a race. So I, I just see it melting down. I see all the horses in the front of the pack just folding folding under and the, and the, and the closer showing up late. Now, who is the right closer? That's the problem in the race is, you know, that's kind of the way the racing gods operate. When you find a meltdown race and you get excited, you, you it's rare that you find the horse that, that has the big kick that you love. So, and that's the case here for me. I, I'm most interested in the 8, 10, and 12. So we're talking about Suedos, Ribchester, and Roly-Poly. Uh, the horses that I have a little bit under them are Lancaster uh, Bomber and, and Bala Rocks. 
I'm not in love with any of these horses. I think Ribchester and Roly Poly, obviously I'm no expert in European form, but they appear to be the best horses. I know Suedos gets uh, a lot of shade thrown on him for, uh, you know, the Keelan race. Uh, it, it, uh, and, and I can see that. I have the, the final in that Keelan race, and my figure is lower than the buyer figure. So, I, you know, I realize it's not a great race. I do think, though, that he's a horse that his style's been changed a little bit, and he may be just, like, finding that finish, and there may be still a little improvement left in him, even though, you know, he's the second time Euro in the U.S. and all that. I'm aware of all that. But I just, something tells me that horse might be, you know, he's going to show up in a number somewhere. J.K., where do you see the, the mile winner coming from? Well, I think the race is going to be, like, like Mike said, the race is going to be, des- is you have to design it from the inside two posts. Um, I actually am kind of warming to the idea that Midnight Storm could get loose here because of the rider of the two heart to heart. I, I don't, I mean, I, I feel like everyone and their mother understands that this, this thing's going to heat up. So why in the world would a rider like Julian, who's been known to grab, go ding donging around there with Midnight Storm, who, who has shown the ability to, to really get after another horse and a pace tool? I, I still think it'll be it'll cook a little bit, but I think Midnight Storm's an interesting one to hold on for a piece like he did in this race last year. Um, I, I'm a big Lancaster Bomber guy in this spot. I think all the attention and the price that world approval is going to be and, and the attention that he's getting. Uh, watch that race back on the Woodbine Mile where he was on the inside. And in fact, that morning I spoke to Mike and he told me, take a, take a look at horses that are going to be on the inside on this day. I think they're going to run better. That's exactly where world approval was. Lancaster Bomber was in the opposite, in the opposite place, four wide around there, and even checked a little bit coming into the stretch. I think Lancaster Bomber can improve. It's Aiden O'Brien. It's all that Euro stuff that we feel good about when we're in our, on our, and when they're running in our grass races. So I'm going to use a little bit of a Lancaster Bomber. I'll use world approval, Ribchester off a of class alone, and then Baller Rocks. I think if you look at his PPs and you put tourist PP right next to it, it's a lot of words. Tourist, Ribchester, <laughs> Baller Rocks, PPs. If you put those two together, they look very similar. And we all talk, we talk about Bill Mott with a target. I think this is kind of a spot he's been trying to get this horse to. And I think Baller Rocks could be a big price to kind of spice things up a little bit. He's interesting. And, and I think for, for those using Baller Rocks, it's hard then not to also use uh, Seward Waz, who you know, ran by him last time. But I do think Baller Rocks an interesting one to consider at uh, potentially a very big price, especially in uh, a bet like the guaranteed late pick four, which kicks off with the Breeders' Cup mile before it moves on to the juvenile. JK, is this a one-horse race? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think this is a foregone conclusion. I think this is probably the most likely uh, likely winner of the weekend. In fact, this is my uh, – when, uh, when people ask me who I like, if they happen to be people that, that tend to uh, aggravate me a bit, I just tell them, who do I like on the weekend? I just say Bolt Doro. And I did it last night at dinner. Uh, someone was like, who do you like this weekend? And I said Bolt Doro. And then I, and then I, I moved on. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, look, I, I think he's talented. I think the figure is, is uh, uh, the buyer gave it uh, is a little bit low, and I understand why he did it. Uh, however, I, I, I tend to think that it should have been a little bit higher, and I, I just think that he's going to, uh, to handle this field pretty easily he's forwardly placed he's he's drawn outside he's won over the track I mean everything you kind of need to see from a horse like that Mike let's talk about the Bolt Doro figure a bit I know you don't make figures for Southern California on the regular but uh, I'm sure you've heard the chatter about uh, buyer's decision to sort of deflate this this number where, where do you uh, not to put you on the spot too much but where, where do you stand on that idea of sort of artificially uh, deflating a figure for a horse like Boltora. Do you, do you think it makes sense? Well, you know, Pete, I think we, we call that projecting a figure and, uh, you know, rather than just relying on the raw variant or the raw time data. So I think anyone that's ever made figures for any length of time realizes that that's a necessity. Sometimes you have to project figures for whatever reason, whether it's weather, whether it's track maintenance, whether it's humidity, whatever the cause the track does change it gets faster or slower during the race card uh you know fairly often so it's something we have to deal with if you don't make that change if you don't project that figure then you end up with a time that that you basically know is wrong so uh i you know i'm perfectly uh happy with with buyer doing it that way and i, I think he he was very conservative with the figure 
So, uh, and even at the, like Jonathan was saying, even at the figure that's on, that, that they gave him, Bolt Doro, he, he lays over the field. So, uh, it, you know, it just looks like anything can happen in a horse race. But I'm not betting against this horse. Everything that I play will be, you know, he'll be a stone single in the picks. Uh, and I've, you know, I've been spreading out in most of the other races or all the other races that we've talked about. There'll be no spreading out in this race. I'm looking for the repeating exact out of the forerunner. I'm thinking it just comes back with Bolt Doro over Solomini again. And to me, the only horse that, that, that I'm going to save with at all is Good Magic. I think Good Magic for Chad can be that improving horse. He's, he's bred to, to get better at a route of ground. So uh, I will be playing Bolt Doro in some tries over Good Magic and Solomini. But uh, if if I don't ice this race, I'm not cashing. I you know it just looks that clear to me. Now I, the only criticism I've heard of Bolt Doro, and I don't agree with it, uh, but I just want to get uh, your opinion on it, Mike. Some have said, thinking about uh, the, that idea again, that the figure is artificially deflated, have brought up the idea: is there a chance this horse could bounce, could regress from the heights of that uh, performance? On the last day, what, what do you think of the, the the bounce as a possibility for Bull Thorough? Well, you you know that may be the most likely scenario that under which you would lose. Uh, and and you know I'm I'm not I don't know a lot about Mick Ruiz, but that would be the you know the the knock on the horse would be that the trainer he may be a very good trainer, but he hasn't been in this position a lot. So with this type of young horse in these type of races and trying to reproduce, you know, grade one efforts in, in a short time, coming right back in a month and trying to do it again. So, uh, you know, that's some concern, but, you know, there's, there, there are always negating factors with every horse. And I think all in all, Bo Doro has, uh, he has about as strong a case to win a race as, as you see in a grade one. Fair enough. I, I think that's a good explanation. There, there's always some negative things you can bring to the table, and it uh, doesn't sound like either of you two are too concerned about that one. But it's still good to be conscious of uh, of what can go wrong when you're when you're trying to put your bets together for a meeting like the Breeders' Cup. Let's talk about race eleven now. It's the Breeders' Cup turf. Mike, uh, why don't you give us your thoughts on this one first? Yeah, th this is. Uh... Uh, this looks Euros to me. I mean, historically, the Euros do very, very well in here. You know, Aiden O'Brien kind of owns this race. I'm, I'm going to stick with, with Highland Real and Ulysses. So, uh, you know, nothing exciting there. But you get, uh, you get Aiden O'Brien. You get Sir Michael Stout. Uh, you know, you get Frankie Vittori and Brian Moore. So. Uh, you're, you're off to a good start right there, the kind of the deck stacked in your favor, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, I can, I can come with uh, some horses that I'm going to play on a B level, Talismanic, uh, the four horse, a decorated knight. I know uh, the European form is probably, guys that really know European form may not, uh, may not agree with that, but I've seen like the other European do well before and, and have stumbled into that luckily a couple of times. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to include him as a B and the, the, the lone U S horse that I have an interest in is beach patrol, uh, just kind of from a pace angle and a, and a Chad angle. So, uh, I'll use them, but I, 80% of my money will be going through Highland real and Ulysses. JK, do you think it's as simple as that on the A level here as well? I do, I do, I, I, I do think it's those, just those two. I think it's perfect. I think if, uh, if Oscar performance doesn't break well and, and doesn't, doesn't get to the lead or can't hang on and uh, causes some Highland Reel could wire him, or if Highland Reel can sit, uh, Ulysses can be close. I just think that both of those horses have so many dynamics. They're, they're, they're tactical enough, both of them, that I don't see a problem with it. And, and they're just they're layups, or layovers, in my opinion, when it comes to. Uh, the time form U.S. figures and and the in the class of racing that they've been participating in uh, over in Europe, you know, the Arc and at Ascot, Champions Day, it's 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 another level for for what Beach Patrol was doing uh, last time at, at uh, in the I think it was the Man of War at at, um, at uh, Belmont. So anyway, those are the two for me. Um, I I can I can probably get a little bit defensive. I would guess with a horse like 
like, uh, um, uh, I don't know why I went blank on Oscar performance. I also kind of want to get a little bit of Sadler's joy underneath. I think that horse will be running late, especially if Oscar performance and uh, Highland Reel happen to hook up. And then a horse that I kind of fell in love with uh, just based on a, a number we've talked about before, Pete, kind of that quicken number where uh, you, you kind of the – yeah, the turn of foot that you can find from a horse, and, and that horse is bigger picture. Uh, I understand that, uh, that the Euros are coming over, but in a mile-and-a-half race, uh, you know, 11 months out of the year, we look at Mike Maker's name and we say, oh, that this one could move up. He's got a shot. This is Mike Maker going a mile-and-a-half on the grass. I think bigger picture is one that could get a piece at a big price underneath. So uh, just to clarify a little bit, you, you mentioned the A's, and then everyone else you mentioned, uh, you, you think about – rolling in there as B's in the horizontals or are those more vertical underneath you? I think they're vertical underneath. And I think if you're, if you're playing ticket maker and you're, you're kind of on these big days, I encourage people to take the full attack that ticket maker offers the A's with the all A's, the A's with one B, the A's with two B's and the A's with C's. I think if you use too many horses as B horses, your B lines can get too expensive. This is the type of race where I would use the top two that we you mentioned Highland Real and Ulysses is A horses. I would use the other ones as C horses because I feel like I want to have them a little bit less. I don't want to tie up so much equity in those horses as Bs. So bigger picture, uh, Oscar performance and Sadler's Joy would be C types for me. Makes sense. Mike, I know you had a point you wanted to make about evaluating these European shippers in terms of the ground. Oh, not not not, uh, not a huge point. Just uh, the the trying to pay more attention to the races that were that were rated good firm uh thinking that that might be the closest that they would uh get to what we're going to see at del mar so you know it's such a big ask for the euros to come over to a a tighter uh turf course that would you know that's so firm and tight uh you, from what they're used to to running on so uh, i think that's uh talent has a lot to do with it but i think a lot of times that that's what makes or breaks the Euros is can they handle the, the turns and can they handle the ground? Well, that leads right into just one I want to throw out there. I don't usually tip horses in these sessions, but uh, it, it's such a perfect piggyback on that point. The one to take a real look at is Seventh Heaven in this race as a potential include. She uh, acts much better on firm ground. She's also run some of her best races going left-handed. I thought she had a really, really rough trip in this race last year. And uh, it's just one on those spread tickets. I, I would think about, uh, I think about, I think about including, especially uh, you've got to figure Highland real will be ridden aggressively, particularly knowing that uh, he, he's got his stable mate back there in seventh heaven who could benefit if things go too fast. Um, I think that was the tactics applied in this race last year with, with found in behind him. And he ended up going, uh, going so perfectly that he ended up winning the race. It's not like he's a rabbit, but it just gives Coolmore two chances to win the Breeders' Cup turf instead of one, and uh, something to, just something to maybe pay a little bit of attention to. Let's go on to race 12. How are we going to get paid here, Mike? Well, uh, first of all, the, the, the real news is the, the first race just ran at Aqueduct, the first race of the meeting, and there was no bias there, so I know you'll be looking at that later. I just wanted to give you the heads up. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I appreciate that. The... Uh, you know, this is a fascinating race. I wish we had a half an hour just to talk uh, race design in the Breeders' Cup Classic. The, if Baffert holds the keys to this race uh, as far as, as, as race design, and it's going to be fascinating to, see, to me to see how it plays out. Uh, first of all, the, 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 what needs to be said first is that Eric is one of the 10 best horses I've ever seen, and if he fires his A race, it's over. He, he'll win in a in a gallop, but my the my horse player experience tells me that that great horses when they start to lose a step when when there's a chink in the armor, it's very rare that they come back to their A race. Uh, maybe he will. I hope he does. But uh, in my experience in in handicapping, that's not been the case very often. So I, I'm going to have to judge him off what I've seen from him, you know, in his last, in his last race kind. Uh, when I, when I look at the race that way, I see only three possible winners. I see arrogant gun runner and collected just like most other handicappers. So I'm, 
I need to design the race. I need to like dig deeper to try to, to try to get an angle here. Well, when I do that, I try to put myself in Baffert's shoes. He has two of those three main contenders. If he, when you look at the raw, the raw pace figures, it appears that Gunrunner will get loose. But I don't think Baffert's going to allow that in here. If, if, there, if, if he looks at this race and there are three main contenders and he trains two of them, is he really going to let the other one get loose in a soft pace? I don't think so. So I, I think he'll tell Martin Garcia to send collected, to, to send and clear. And Gunrunner, Florent Giroux on Gunrunner, I believe, will be perfectly content to let that happen. He's a push-button horse. It's not like he really needs the lead. So I think he'll be very happy to be second. So I think Collective will clear, Gunrunner lay second. That'll put Arrogant in kind of a pocket trip where he'll lay third or fourth a few lengths off, and then on the turn, Smith will tip him out and get him in probably great striking position on the outside. I think Gunrunner is a little better than Collected, and I think Gunrunner will win the, the battle up front. And, you know, at, at, at the – at the top of the lane or the eighth pole, he'll put collect it away and go on. And then it'll just be, you know, what we're waiting for kind of, it'll be gun runner fighting on the lead and, and arrogant coming after him. I, I, I'm going to lean to gun runner. And I, in knowing that arrogant is tons of best horse, I just, my experience tells me that w when horses get in this spot and I have all the respect in the world for Baffert, I have all the respect in the world for Mike Smith, but I, you know, I just, uh, I'm going to bet that he doesn't run by. So it's not a huge play for me, but uh, since since my only opinion is, hey, the the top three choices are the only horses that can win, I have to do something creative here in my mind to, you know, to get into the race straight. So, you know, in the picks, I'll protect myself with uh, Gun Runner as a strong A, Arrogate as a weaker A, and Collected as a B. But inside the race, I'm just going to try to get Gunrunner to to get the job done. And the only other horse that I would mention in there, there are several horses. Of course, West Coast could run in on the bottom of, of things. But I think Pavel is a horse that is improving rapidly. I think Creative Cause is, is a really good young stallion. And uh, I think there's a horse that if you're playing Super Factors, uh, Super High Five, whatever, that there's a horse that included a price is Pavel on the bottom. All right, JK Breeders' Cup Classic. How do you see it? Uh, I mean, I love the way Mike designed the race. I mean, it's exactly how I I would see that it would happen. I, to be honest, I think it'd be a really interesting race, an even more interesting race if Collected wasn't in there because I think they would send Arrogate from the inside, and that would be the match race we wanted to see all the way around there. We wouldn't have to wait to the stretch to see it. So. Um, look, I, I think Arrogate's going to get that pocket trip. I think that, and I've expressed a few times on the podcast before that I don't think Arrogate doesn't like the surface. I think Arrogate was just a miss. I just think something wasn't right. I think they, they backed off of him. They're, you know, Baffert keeps saying, put weight on him, put some more weight on him. And, uh, I think he'll run well. I think he's going to run well in this spot. I'm going to try to be alive to both of those two. Um, and 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 him and Gunrunner, but uh, I I think Arrogate is is going to be my top pick. My underneath sneaky one uh, we've talked about before is is Gunavera. He ran really well in the Travers, and I think he's the type of horse that could could pick up third a piece for third and fourth uh, when the rest of them can't. All right, some good thoughts there from uh, uh, the panel. Thank you, gentlemen, both so much. Jonathan Kinchin, of course, of the DRF Players Podcast. Mike Maloney, author of the new book, Betting with an Edge. Check it out. It's going to be on sale any minute now on DRF.com. We're going to have Mike back in various formats to, uh, to, to discuss more about uh, the, bo the book, more about his ideas on handicapping, uh, and maybe we'll get some uh, – maybe we'll convince you to tell a couple stories too, Mike. What do you think? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm an easy mark for that, Pete. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. If you want to watch – this is the most frequently asked question in the history of these handicapping sessions. If you want to watch the replay, we covered a lot of ground very quickly because of time constraints. Don't worry. You can catch the replay, drf.com slash YouTube. Uh, Producer Jake will have that up in no time, I'm sure. And uh, you can go back to that and check out lots of other great handicapping content produced by drf.com. 
I'm Peter Thomas Fornatal. Thank you so much for joining us for this sort of special edition of the DRF podcast, if you will. May you win all your Breeders' Cup photos.